Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. Today is the 31st monthly Q&A. A quick announcement before we proceed. I'd like to inform you that, starting three weeks ago, I began posting one or two sentences per day on the community section of my YouTube channel. For a very long time now, I have wanted to write down my understanding of a practice in a concise but precise fashion. Some of my students recommended writing them down on paper. Then I asked myself, why not write it in public? After looking for a convenient platform, I decided to use the community section of YouTube to host this content. Also, I noticed that some people responded to those community posts already. Thank you all for the responses. For now, I am only posting my thoughts in public. I may talk about those in a more organized manner in future videos. That's about it in terms of announcements. There will be many interesting questions answered in today's video. So, Thank you all for sending them my way and also apologies in advance to all whose names I will butcher today. But first, let's warm up with a Dao De Jin commentary and Xiu Dao. Today's topic is Zhuan Qi Zhi Rou, a famous sentence from chapter 10 of Dao De Jin. The whole chapter is very important since it has been used in Xiu Dao practice for two thousands of years. In chapter 9, Lao Zi talked about Ren Dao, the way of humans. Later, in chapter 10, Lao Zi introduced the ideal behavior of sages in terms of self cultivation. In the first part of this chapter, he not only asked six questions but also answered them at the same time. The term Zhuan Qi Zhi Rou is the second in these six questions. He asked, quote, Zai Ying Po Bao Yi, Neng Wu Li Hu, <coughs> Zhuan Qi Zhi Rou, Neng Ru Ying Er Hu. End quote. Translation Unite physically and mentally to embrace the Tao. Can you keep them from separating? Concentrating breath to attain softness. Can you be like an infant? Purify the subconscious desires. Can you keep them from thought? Love the people and enliven the state. Can you do it without action? Open and close the universe portal. Can you be the female? Be enlightened and uh, comprehend all, can you do it without knowledge? End the translation. So, these six criteria stated by Lao Zi were six aspects of how a sage would behave according to Tao. Again, the Tao of humans follows the Tao of heaven, or Ren Dao follows Tian Dao. So, Following these six questions and answers, Lao Zi continued by saying, quote, Sheng zhi, xu zhi, sheng er bu you, wei er bu shi, zhang er bu zai, shi wei xuan de. End quote. Translation, the Tao produces all things and nourishes them. It produces them and does not claim them as its own. It does all and yet does not boast of it. It leads all and yet does not control them. This is what is called profound virtue. End translation. So, Lao Zi used a new term, Xuan De, 
or profound virtue to describe the specific attitude of a sage. Now, let's talk about the application of these six questions and answers used in Xiu Dao practice. These six questions, total in 12 sentences, actually explain the overall Xiu Dao practice. In other words, Taoist practitioners have used these six questions to describe the six steps of the energy refinement process. By the way, there is no specific number of steps in energy refinement. These six steps are just an approximate figure, not necessarily six steps in practice. Many terms used in Xiu Dao practice actually arise from these six questions. Prominent examples are Yang Po Bao Yi, or the unity of body and mind, a key concept in Xiu Dao practice. Zhuan Qi Zhi Rou, or concentrate on energy to reach a subtle state, an important step to enter the prenatal state. Xuan Lan, or mystery observation, the correct mental work in energy refinement process. Tian Men Kai He, or opening and closing of the heaven gate, the critical gate for spirit to move out and in of the body, among many others. So, chapter 10 of Tao Te Ching has had a profound impact on Xiu Dao practice for more than two millennia. Now, let me explain it a step deeper. The second question and answer to these six topics is Zhuan Qi Zhi Rou. Zhuan means to concentrate, to gather. Qi means energy. Zhi means lead to, result in. Rou means softness. In practice, Xiu Dao practitioners should pay attention to prenatal energy. However, to reach the level of emerging prenatal energy, the mind should reach a prenatal state too. So, Lao Zi used the word Rou or softness to express the prenatal state. Softness does not mean the physical body becoming soft, but the energy experience becoming subtle which is the starting point of the emergence of uh, prenatal energy. This is why the next sentence, Neng Ru Yang Er Hu O, can be as an infant. In Tao's practice, infant means the Yuan Yang O, prenatal infant O, embryotic energy, a result of energy refinement. In other words, embryotic energy is the result of uh, Zhuan Qi Zhi Rou, or concentrating on energy to reach the prenatal state. To summarize, the 10th chapter of Tao Te Ching describes the overall Xiu Dao practice, the energy refinement process. It is a chapter that has had a profound impact on Tao's practice in history. With that, let's move on to our monthly Q&A. Questions answered in today's video include First, Stephen Ambrosik, Xiu Dao, Three Elixirs. Next, Dark Van Duke, Daozem, Five Elements Significance. Next, Dark Van Duke, Xing Yi, Yin Yang Movements. Next, Dark Van Duke, Ba Gua, Long Sword and Saber. Next, Dark Van Duke, Tai Chi, Hong Jun Sheng and Feng Zhi Qiang versions. Next, Bruno, Xing Yi, Brother Sword. Next, Bruno, Miao Dao. Next, Offer JRL, Standard of Energy Feeling. Next, Offer JRL, Tai Chi, uh, Pelvis Issues. Next, You Got One, Single Leg Balance. Next, Da Cheng Ruo Jue, Wang Xiang Jai's comments on Xing Yi and Ba Gua. Next, Carlton and uh, um, Four Year Polo Me, Yi Chuan and uh, Wang Xiangzai. <coughs> Finally, Dragon Phoenix, 
Qigong and Silk Reeling. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Stephen Ambrosik asks a question about Xiu Dao. He says, quote, In the presentation, you again refer to the great elixir Da Dan in the Q&A from 21st May 15. You utilize the primary reference book Da Cheng Jie Yao, Great Achievement Method. You identify the three type of elixirs: Jin Dan, Golden Elixir, Shen Dan, Divine Elixir, and Da Dan, Great Elixir. At 20 minutes 38, in that Q and A, you mentioned that which in each level there are three type of elixirs as well for a total of nine levels. What are the three subtype elixirs in each of Jin Dan, Shen Dan, Da Dan levels? Since you have the primary reference of Da Cheng Jie Yao, are those three subtype elixirs listed there for each of the three elixir level? End quote. <coughs> Thank you, Stephen. Interesting question. I'm impressed by your attention to detail. The three terms used in that book. Jin Dan, uh, Shen Dan, and Da Dan were the categories to classify the different type of elixir practice. Unfortunately, that book only introduced the Tian Yuan elixir method, which is the most popular method. He did not introduce the other two methods since the author believed the other two methods shared the same principle as Tian Yuan. Actually, he emphasized the Qingjing method or Tranquil method instead of burning elixir pills or other method. As for the Tian Yuan elixir method, actually he used 24 steps to talk about it, which is a lot more than 3 levels of 9 steps. It is a complete system that is hard to explain in a Q&A. In Montreal, I have systematically introduced this method to some of my students. I may talk about this document in future on this channel. Stephen, I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. <coughs> Dr. Van Duke asked a few questions which I will answer one by one. Question 1, I quote, about Dao De Jing. It seems that Taoism regards water very highly. For example, the highest good is like water. But I wonder about the other elements. What are the significance of fire, earth, wood, etc. in Taoism philosophy and practice? And it is said that the sage should be like water. Then what kind of people should be like fire, like earth, and so on, from a Taoism point of view? End quote. This is a history related question. Very often, people use the term yin yang, wu xing, or yin yang and five elements to describe the Taoist philosophy. Actually, this term includes two concepts yin yang and wu, five elements. The yin yang theory predates wu xing by a lot. Yin Yang was popular even during Lao Tzu's time, and Wu Xing or Five Elements came much later in the Zhang Guo or Warring States period. So, when Lao Tzu wrote his book Dao De Jing, the Five Element theory was not popular yet. That's why Lao Tzu only talked about the virtue of water or Shui De in his book. Later on, Taoism used the five element theory to explain the relationship between the five basic elements in the universe that drive the world to evolve. So, the combination of yin yang theory and the five element theory was a much later invention. Question 2 quote, About the Xing Yi, there is a video talk talk about Song style Xing Yi Quan that introduces the yin yang application of Xing Yi. The examples in that video is the Pi Quan, which is the yin application is pushing upward with the chest muscle, while its yang application is pushing downward with the back muscles. So, 
one form had at least two variations of a shape. Can you explain briefly about the yin yang variation? And do other styles of xing yi have this concept of yin yang? And if not, can it be applied to them as well? End the quote. <coughs> Every xing yi element has a yin and yang movement in it. But yin yang is not the way to break down a xing yi movement. The basic movement of the chest is the opening and closing, no matter what branch of xing yi. So, what you mentioned here is just another way to explain the xing yi body movement mechanism, and that applies to all xing yi styles. Question 3 a quote about Ba Gua. It seems that for weapon training, Ba Gua prefers sword and saber that are longer than the standard sword and saber. Is there a specific reason for that preference? And it is, is this bad if the practitioner don't have a long sword or saber? And commonly for sword and saber with that length, martial artists use both hands to hold the sword saber, for example, Shuang Shou Jian and Miao Dao, but somehow Ba Gua practitioners only use one hand to hold it. Isn't it dangerous to hold it with one hand only? Because it lacks the power and speed compared to holding it with both hands. End quote. Since Ba Gua practice moves in a circular pattern, it is better to use the heavy weapon to train the body in terms of the coordination between the body and the weapon. Since the long weapon is heavier in general, it is more suitable for practicing the Ba Gua body method. If you cannot find a long one, then using a short one is fine, but you have to pay attention to the Ba Gua body method. Weapon training is for practicing the body method. So, as long as you can get this done, that would be fine, or else you may have to find a longer weapon. Shuang Shou Jian O double handed sword has a different training purpose compared to Ba Gua weapon. It is not dangerous to practice Ba Gua weapon with one hand at all. Different weapon trainings can benefit different body methods specifically designed for the style. If you think it lacks power to hold a weapon with one hand, that's wrong since it should work with the body method. Please try it out you yourself first, and I'm sure you will figure out the reason. Question 4. Quote, about the Tai Chi, can you talk about the Hong Junsheng and the Feng Zhiqiang versions of Chen style Tai Chi? I heard they learned directly from Chen Fa Ke, but their version look very different from standard Chen style Tai Chi, and I heard there is Xin Yi Liu He influence in it, but I don't understand which part is being influenced. End quote. It is hard to introduce the practice of Hong Junsheng and Feng Zhiqiang in a Q&A video. I will introduce both their practice in the future, but. To quickly answer your question, yes, they are different, but the fundamentals are the same. As a martial artist, we have to be able to identify not only the similarities from the differences, but also the differences from the similarities. Dr. Wenduk, I hope that answered all your questions for now. I will talk about some of this topic more in the future. Let's look at the next one. Bruno asked two questions about weapon practice. Quote, Talking about Xing Yi broadsword, what kind of a Dao is more historically correct for practicing Xing Yi? Oxtail or Willow Leaf Dao? End quote. Mm. There are different types of saber or broadsword used in Xing Yi practice. In general, Xing Yi uses a solid blade broadsword. Usually, it is in Liu Yi Dao or Willow Leaf shape. However, Li Sun Yi, the great Hebei style Xing Yi master, used a special saber called Shuang Shou Dai or two hand pulling. 
my grandfather left behind the design of the shuang shou dai and may reproduce it in the future. It is a double-handed broadsword but much heavier than the common liu ye dao. Bruno the second question, quote, do you know if some Miao Dao system passed generation to generation from the Ming Dynasty until now? End quote. <clears throat> Miao Dao is a rather new name used in the Republic time of China around the 1920s by Liu Yuchun and Guo Changsheng. Originally, it was called Qi Jia Dao or Qi Family Sword, invented by Qi Ji Guang. The Ming Dynasty general in order to be more effective in fighting with Japanese soldiers. In history, two important documents written about 450 years ago, Xin Yu Dao Fa written by Qi Ji Guang and the Dan Dao Fa Xuan by Cheng Chongdou, recorded the practice of uh, this weapon. This weapon has been very popular since the Republic area. For example, Cao Kun, the president of China in 1923, invited Guo Changsheng, the best Miao Dao master of the time, to teach his army. Later on, in 1927, Guo Changsheng was also invited to teach this weapon at the Zhongyang Guo Shu Wan or National Martial Art Academy. It is worth noting that the Miao Dao routine was invented by Guo Changsheng and his teacher Liu Yuchun based on the Tong Bi Quan empty hand movement. Guo Ruixiang, one of the best martial artists of the Tong Bi, promoted this practice decades ago. He reproduced this weapon and taught this weapon to many students in China. I have a weapon produced by Guo Ruixiang and that is the series number of the weapon 0015. Back then, there were only 15 units of this weapon in the community. Thank you for asking. <clears throat> Offer JRL asked two questions. Let me answer for him one by one. His first question called, How can we know if we are experiencing or fulfilling prenatal energy or postnatal when we are practicing? It is a very good question. Each stage of energy refinement in Xiu Dao produces different specific feelings. Even though different people may experience different energy feelings, overall, those feelings are very similar. For example, those ratings in the ancient Xiu Dao classics are some examples of it. However, when it comes to experiences of prenatal energy, they are much more subtle and very often also very hard to distinguish. I will find a chance to talk about it more in the future. It is a very advanced topic and hard to explain sufficiently in a Q&A as it could potentially mislead people in their practice. His second question quote, Does practicing Tai Chi can cause pelvic prolapse or pelvic floor prolapse? especially in women, if there are a person with a, a pelvic floor prolapse, can Tai Chi help recovering from it? Well, it is a medical related question. I have never heard any occurrence of a date issue when practicing Tai Chi. On the contrary, I have read some research reports in China that Tai Chi exercises have helped to accelerate the recovery from this health issue. So, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about it. Thank you for asking. Let's move on to the next one. You got one to ask a question about balanced practice. Called, I practice Yang style Tai Chi and uh, well perform the form sometimes have a difficult with any kind of one leg stance, especially right uh, heel kick and left heel kick. Do you have any advice for improving one's balance when on 
one like only. And thank you for the question. You got one. Since I don't know you and your practice situation personally, I will only provide a generic answer here. Well, balance is very important in any martial art training. But first, a disclaimer. If you have any injuries or other physical limitations because of age or other factors that may affect your balance, please first consult with your physician before going any further with your balance practice. I assume no responsibility for any afterward consequences arising out of unsupervised practice. With that said, here's my general advice for improving balance practice. Speaking from experience, I suggest the following steps. First, spend a couple of minutes every day to practice balance. For example, just keep your eyes open and relax the mind and the body. Then gradually lift one foot and maintain that posture with one leg. In the early stage, you do not need each section to be very long. Instead, you can have multiple small sections every day. Second, gradually increase the training duration for each section. For example, from 2 minutes to 5 minutes. Third, after you are comfortable with step 2, you can gradually add some movements with your hand while maintaining balance on one leg. Then make the movement faster. If you can still maintain balance, then move on to step 4. 4. Repeat step 1 to 3 with eyes closed. If you follow these 4 steps, I guarantee you will not have any trouble maintaining balance in a single leg stance. So, if you are able and willing, please give it a try and let me know the result after 3 months. Hope that answers your question. Let's move on to the next one. Da Cheng Luo Jue asks, quote, There is a story where Wang Xiangzhai fought a Xing Yi mass fighter, then criticized Xing Yi for its animal forms. Then he later fought a Bagua fighter and criticized it for having too many forms, saying originally there were only three old palms. Lao San Zhang. Would anyone be able to answer that were the three old palms? Hello, Da Cheng Ruo Jue. That is a good question. First of all, let's go to the technical part. The Lao San Zhang is Dan Shuang Shun, the short term for single change palm, double change palm, and smooth change palm, respectively. They are the first three palms of the Bagua eight palm practice. Sometimes people say Xiao Zhang, Gai Zhang, Ye Zhang are the old three palms. This is not the right version since the Xiao, Gai, and Ye are just three basic movements, not considered a palm in Bagua. Now let's talk about Wang Xiangzhai's writing. Actually, all of his writings and interviews, including his students' work, are collected in this book. In June 1940, a journalist of Shibao, a popular Beijing local new newspaper, interviewed Wang Xiangzhai and published the whole interview in the paper. In the interview, the journalist asked him many questions. One of the questions was about the training method. Wang said that in practice, form practice alone is not as important or effective as understanding some key principles and focusing on the fundamental movements. If we perceive that Wang said during the interview to be for emphasizing the martial principle and the fundamentals, then his intentions were noble. However, what he said about the training contents of Xing Yi and Ba Gua were not correct at all. Let me explain. He said, quote, 
，嫡传并无十二行练法，然周身十二行之意，当尽有之。Translation: The original 行义 does not have the twelve animal practices. However, the whole body should have the twelve animals' spirit or mind. In translation, again, this is wrong. First, Li Luoneng was the founder of Xing Yi, and there were five elements and twelve animals practiced already, or else it would not be called Xing Yi. Wang Xiangzhai also claimed to have learned from Guo Yunshen, one of the eight disciples of Li Luoneng. Who practiced and taught twelve animal forms? Guo wrote his book, and those contents are in his book. Some people said that Wang Xiangzhai did not learn Xing Yi from Guo Yunshen, as he so claimed, but actually learned from his own brother-in-law Li Bao, a disciple of Guo Yunshen. Some research. Thus, even proved that Wang Xiangzhai changed his date of birth in order to look older for the plausibility of learning from Guo Yunshen. According to Wang's year of birth in 1885, he was 13 years old when Guo passed away. According to other people's statements, Wang was actually born in 1890, not 1885. Making him eight years old at the time of Guo Yunshen's death. So, if he learned the twelve animals from Guo Yunshen, he would have claimed this since Guo Yunshen taught twelve animals. Also, technically speaking, how can someone have the animal spirit without practicing animal form? With imagination alone, speculation, or anything else? It just doesn't make any sense. If a great martial artist like Wang Xiangzhai could make such a big mistake, it's really no surprise to see average people make mistakes. Back to the topic of the interview, he also talked about Bagua practice in the same interview. He first praised how good Cheng Tinghua was. Cheng Tinghua was the founder of the Cheng style Bagua. He then said that Liu Fengchun was good, but not as good as Cheng Tinghua in some aspect. Then he said Liu Fengchun was still much better than those who only practiced the sixfold palms and the seventy-two kicks and so on. So here he emphasized how good Liu Fengchun was, since Liu focused on fundamentals. Now the problem is. Wang never practiced Ba Gua himself, so why did he say that Ba Gua practitioners should not practice eight big palms and the other, but only focus on the three palms? Without personal training experience, he should not have made such a claim. Again, a great martial artist randomly answered some questions. Outside his area of expertise, in an exaggerated way. By the way, these parts have been recorded in his book. Please read it for yourself if you want to find the original version. I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. Kelton asked a question about Wang Xiangzhai, to which, um. For E. Polomi responded with a comment, also likely meant for me. So I'd like to answer both of these two questions. Kelton said, "Quote: I do enjoy your very informative videos and do so appreciate all the information you share. I have long wondered if each one should be considered an art within itself, or as I more tr truly believe it is." As was deemed when Wang Xiangzhai created it, Da Chengquan, a great achievement of study and understanding and the mastery of internal style, it would it would be interesting if you ever decided to do a segment addressing this dynamic. Thanks with respect, Kelton. End quote. 
Thank you, Captain. It is a good question for sure. Wang Xiangzhai was the great martial artist who studied Xing Yi and eventually developed Yi Quan or Da Cheng Quan based on Xing Yi practice. He is one of the great martial artists that I will always respect. His practice and his writings, especially his writings, are among the best martial art documents in history. I know many Yi Quan practitioners in person, including Wang Yufang, the daughter of Wang Xiangzhai, and many of them have reached a very advanced level. Also, whether I believe Yi Quan should be an art within itself or not doesn't mean anything to others. But to answer your question, my opinion is that Yi Quan should be considered an art within itself. For Yi Po Lomi, responded to Captain's comment, quote, I also think that is a very important question to address. Wang Xiangzhai was definitely an important person in the martial arts circles at the time, but also because I came to encounter some of your students that are also teachers and they told me they didn't see the teachings of Wang Xiangzhai as valid and definitely not a good system to develop any fighting skills. I, I would be much eager to know your opinion on the teachings of researchers of Wang Xiangzhai and the code. Now let me respond to Fu Yi Polomi's comment. First of all, you said that some of my students who are teachers themselves told you that they did not see the teachings of Wang Xiangzhai as valid. Well, I will need more information before I can accurately respond to that comment. I have many students who are teachers, so I have no idea who you are referring to. And even more interesting is that some people claim to be my students from China, but actually I have no idea who they, who they are. That's why I replied to your comment asking about the person's name. Since you said in your comment that person is a student of mine, I really have no idea about who that person is. Of course, my students have always had their freedom to share their opinions, which sometimes do not represent mine. So, what is my opinion on this topic? I have said many times in my videos that Wang was one of the best martial artists in history due to his uh, contribution to martial art practice and theory. Yes, I know some people who really dislike him due to many reasons, both political and technical. But I always focus on the technical aspect. On the other hand, when some people are unhappy to see that someone is criticizing Wang Xiangzhai, actually what Wang Xiangzhai did in his time was even more dramatic. He was always criticizing other styles no matter if he knew their practice or not. Perfect example being the question I answered right before this one. So, I believe if Wang Xiangzhai was still alive, he would not care too much about it. Even so, I do not criticize his practice at all since, as I said, that he was one of the best practitioners in history. I have always wanted to introduce Wang Xiangzhai, but my limited experience with Yi Quan always stopped me from going forward. I hope I have answered your questions, Captain and uh, Foyi Polomi. Now, let's move on to the final question for today. Dragon Phoenix asked a question about silk reeling as uh, Qigong. He said, quote, Silk reeling exercises were first introduced to me as silk reeling Qigong, but I have not seen many other references but it being Qigong. Are the silk reeling exercises created by Chen Fa Ke to be done as Qigong, or should they just be regarded as a fundamental movement exercise? End quote. <clears throat> Interesting question. Thank you, Dragon Phoenix. First of all, silk reeling exercises are not Qigong at all. 
There is no such term as silk reeling qigong. Silk reeling energy is a martial art skill training oriented exercise, not aimed at developing the commonly practiced qigong exercise. Of course, if someone practices silk reeling exercise under the qigong guidance and follows the basic qigong principles, that would be considered a qigong exercise. But silk reeling exercises are not qigong exercises by themselves. Silk reeling was not created by Chen Fa Ke, but it is the fundamental Tai Chi energy exercise aimed at improving Tai Chi energy used in martial art application. It has existed since the beginning of Tai Chi. As Chen Xin, the great Tai Chi scholar in history, said in his book, quote, Tai Chi Quan, Chan Fa Ye, end quote. Translation, Tai Chi Quan is the practice of, of uh, silk reeling. End translation. Mm. So, Tai Chi is not a Qigong practice, but originally a martial art style, and silk reeling is meant for developing martial art skills not for the primary purpose of health as in Qigong exercises. I hope I have answered your question, Dragon Phoenix. That brings us to the end of the, this month's Q&A. Thank you all for your questions and I hope you find my answers informative. As always, please don't hesitate to ask further questions. Thanks for watching, see you next time, and Enjoy your practice.